Force of it was interesting because there were some people who I do think it criticized, and I'm not pining on the value of that criticism in this moment, but by certain parts of the left for being um, kind of elite and out of touch, who did support Force the Vote. So, you know, Kyle Kalinske and Crystal Ball and Cornel West, and there were a lot of people who have sometimes had opinions that I know get, get critiqued in this space, who did, at least at that moment, see the strategic value of doing something like Force the Vote. And I, I wonder what you make of that, CJ. And, and that is, and this also speaks to another blind spot of the left. Um, it's their ability to pick and choose when they want to be actually for the policy and when they want to just kind of, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, where you're pretending as if you're doing it. So in, in this case, we'll force the vote. Now, uh, we had some on this, you know, this class divide, some who I refer to as leftists. I'm sorry, reformists and others who re, who, re, who use the term boutique. Now, one person can uh, cause you not to support something you say is a, a is a the number one priority of the left, and that is health care. What does that say about your conviction? What does that say to your audience? And why are you? Why is your audience listening to you if if they can be re- derailed by a person? by one single person. It was the absurdity of that. And and and, and remember, Brie, forced to vote was sort of my first in this space, because I've only been in this space maybe a, uh, coming up on two years. It was the first time in this space where I'm seeing the absurdity on people who are calling them the left. Now, I, you know, I, I see it in their critiques, in, in their lack of critiques with the Israel-Palestine, but that's sort of baked then. This healthcare thing I thought was one of the things that reformists and revolutionists like like this is a no-brainer right so this was one of the first things that kind of opened my eye to the ridiculousness of what i call uh reformists can i ask something Bree? can i ask regarding the class divide on force to vote because there are a lot of people that is in the lower class who need health care who wasn't that found of jimmy Dore, but they did not allow that to distract them from the issue Hmm. i noticed a lot of people who did not need health care was allowing their support to be decided whether they had a beef with a podcaster or not. That is stuff that only people who are privileged had time to worry about. There, and I cannot emphasize again, I know people who did not like Jimmy, but they supported Force to Vote because they needed health care. That is the position you take if you are in a position where you have to fight for it instead of being in a comfortable position in an air-conditioned studio where you're more worried about um, taking the upper hand on your beat instead of fighting for the issues that we find important, right? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I am, I'm sympathetic to that argument, but I also know that there are people who are going to say, well, if sometimes the people in the air-conditioned studio were on the right side of the thing, and if there's a such thing as a class trader, even if you shouldn't maybe trust them uh, as as much as you would someone who has class similar class identity, and if there were working class people who were against force the vote, I mean, that was also true, then, you know, is there, you know, is that the kind of, should that be the full extent of the analysis, even if it's a a meaningful part of the analysis? So I'm thinking, for example, of a conversation that I had recently with Crystal Ball on this show, where I think we had a good faith disagreement about what approach was most likely to result in benefits. And I think that from the perspective of someone like Crystal, that she believes that the likelihood of there being any real progress and that's a very nebul- neb- nebulous and kind of ill-defined thing, real real progress, which I think is part of the problem. But, you know, from, from her perspective, it seemed to me to be the case that if it's very unlikely that you're going to get, say, Medicare for all from uh, a third party run, then even if the odds of mounting an insurgent candidacy within the Democratic Party are very slim, that is the more practical thing to do and the better use of someone's time. And from my perspective, I think that question is very much up in the air, given how we have had it demonstrated to us again and again and again exactly how tough it is to do things on the inside and how slim the odds are from doing it on the inside as well. So it's not diminishing how difficult an outside run is or the likelihood of like traditional success from an outside run, but it's to say, well, 
if they've now shown us over the course of the last decades that an inside run is next to impossible, then why are you still committed to an, you know, an inside approach? And I think it's the perspective of, the difference is, from my perspective, the, you know, do you think, or how, how much do you think that we've exhausted the ability to do what we can do within the Democratic Party? And that while there, I think there's probably a good faith disagreement on that, I am increasingly firm on the belief that there's not much to be done there. I wonder what you make of that, Sabi. Do, do you think that there's like a, a good faith reading here or is, is it completely about kind of people's relative comfort levels in class? I think part of it is about comfort level in class. But one mm-hmm. thing I, I do want to point out in reference to that Justice Democrat strategy, mm-hmm. and CJ actually reminded me of this on a stream that he did a while back. Part of that strategy was to also start a third party movement. In fact, the Humanist Report covered this. That piece was never implemented. So when we had these progressive candidates get into D.C. and and they're supposed to fight for us and they're not fighting for or fighting back against legislation where they had leverage, there was no backup plan. There was nothing else to fall back on. There was no third party movement that was started that was supposed to go along with this strategy. So now it was just like you had to run cover for these progressive politicians, try to make excuses for them and try to convince viewers why you still need to support that strategy, even though people could see what was happening and what was going on. And this is where I think a lot of us at RBN, we point to a general strike. Because this is an example that shows that the inside game is not working. So what do you do? You go back to the outside game. If you want to look at something like a general strike, we just saw the railroad workers. They were threatening to strike. Look how quickly Joe Biden jump in to respond and act because that affects the supply chain. So if you have the railroad workers and if you have the truckers and if you can have the port workers, which are also uh, under duress right now on the West Coast, You get all three of those on board. That's your general strike. The quickest and fastest way to do it is through transportation, shutting down transportation services because it affects the supply chain. So that's something that we feel should be heavily pushed. And that's an outside game. And we know that the response would be faster because we just saw Joe Biden respond quickly to the railroad workers. But you need to have a list of demands. So if you look at some of those policies that Bernie Sanders had, I think all of those should be included in the demands, not just higher pay, but give everybody health care, give everybody paid uh, child care, give people paid sick leave, which one of the things that they were fighting for was just having paid sick leave. Those kind of things need to be added as a list of, of demands. And I think that can work faster. So all of us are frustrated about climate change. That's not gonna work quickly through the Democratic Party. They'll pass like weak climate legislation And at the same time, they're still doing fracking. They're still getting around that bill that was just passed. I just saw this with the state of Maryland. They're already working with oil uh, refineries in West Virginia, where that's Joe Manchin's territory. So, of course, he's going to go along with that. So I think for people who want to just do that inside strategy, I think they're going to have to focus on getting money out of politics. As long as the corporate money is there, it's going to be corrupt and they're going to serve corporate interests not the interests of the people. The other, the other avenue that they could do is they need to direct their focus more on local politics. Some of these policies that Bernie Sanders had on his platform, we've already implemented here in states like Massachusetts or in CJ state like California. We already have paid family leave in Massachusetts for everybody. We passed the right for 15 years ago, and they've already passed the, the workers' rights in the sense that you don't have to disclose your salary when you're looking for a job. So a lot more can be done on the local level electorally than on the national level. So if you want to fight for those issues on the national level, I think the best way to do it is a general strike. And I think you need to focus more so on third party and independent candidates to really disrupt that duopoly. Can I can I jump in there um, when, sure. when we're saying because this is a key part in understanding that this conversation when we're talking about third party and the duopoly, we have to get out of the framing of third party is the same as it's going to be the same way. We have to get out of this thinking that moving to a third party means the next election we're winning. That is not the strategy of a third party or it should not be. You have to build the third party like what Savvy was uh, uh, referring to here, building it locally, 
be going for local races, student councils, going for city councils. That's it's a slow bill. Now think of this for those that, you know, in the professional managerial class, like you, who you had on your show a couple of days ago, uh, David Sirota is another one who have you. We have them on video saying I've been at this task for decades. So if I were to say what is the difference in trying to work within the system, a party that does not want you, dark money is an example, does not want you for 20 or 30 years, then you building up the Green Party for 20, 30 years. Why is the Green Party's expectation the next election, but the Democratic ex expectation is decades? The framing is already off. You see what I'm saying? So when the yeah. comparison is not this party who's been literally the democratic party is one of two parties that's been around the for 200 years i think the tories the other party there's no other party more so this party that's 200 years old what are you going to do green party in four years it's it's such a ridiculous uh uh framing of the of the idea of switching to a third party that's not at all the comparison so we have to build a third party i would say the kashama sawant uh, style of politics if you want to participate in the in the duopoly while doing the general strike stuff that Sabi spoke about should be the way so, uh, Kashama Sawat says which is basically of course it can't be the Democratic Party that is a strategic flaw that you're teaming up with people who are working against the working class and you're representing the working class that is a strategic flaw that's like teaming up with a that's like a communist teaming up with a capitalist to bring socialism that doesn't make any sense so we have these very weird uh contradictory partnerships that's never going to materialize anything for the people at the very very bottom they're always it's always going to stop at a certain level always and then the response i've heard to that and i'm going to pass it back to you the response i've heard to that is well Obama, Medicare or Medicaid expansion, really? You're talking about the thing that requires you to be in a perpetual state of poverty? You're talking about that thing? Like that's the thing we're putting on the mantle as, as the thing, the great thing that we can accomplish through electoralism. And who are we forgetting again? The people have to remain in poverty. Yeah, I, I think that's a really excellent point. You know, you have people, you know, and I respect their work in in the organizing space, which I'm not in an, an enormous deal. But there are these there are these um, quips like uh, no shortcuts, right? There are these terms that always are applied to folks who are looking for alternatives to working within the Democratic Party that presumes that they're looking for an easy way out, or they're not willing to work, or that they're sitting this out, or that they're you know throwing up their hands and giving up any responsibility for any change making in the world when it's quite the opposite. And the the gap between the standards applies to the Democratic Party in terms of how much needs to be achieved and in what time frame and what is expected of alternative strategies that are just getting off the ground is huge and speaks volumes. But I want to come back to you for a second, Nick, because, you know, Sabi, I think, very importantly raised this issue of the general strike and how strike actions, generally speaking, should be putting more pressure and have been demonstrated to put more pressure even in this last week or so on the administration and get more of a response from the administration than any number of protests, including um, millions of people in the streets in the summer of 2020, um, who basically were told, you ain't black if you don't vote for Biden. And also, you know, we saw in the leaked Biden call that fall with all of the black leaders in the country, where he basically said, you know, it's not your turn to shine. We're not going to think about you. We're talking about you right now. And I, I wonder what you make of the pushback that you get when you even bring up a conversation. If you just say the word general strike, I know that you experienced a great deal of pushback when you did the general strike summit, was that last year or earlier this year? Um, and I've noticed it too, because I just recently reached out to a bunch of labor reporters to talk about the, the um, tr tr rail strike. And if I mention even to, you know, can you talk about the history of the general strike on the episode in my request, I've gotten already some pushback saying, I just don't think it's appropriate to talk about it right now. Um, so uh, wh what do you make of that, Nick? So there are people who need to reconcile with the fact that no matter who's in charge, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican charge, 
the quality of life for the workers and household income has fallen, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat is, is in charge, because both parties are waging a class war on behalf of their donors. And if you vote for that, if you give them credibility, you are giving them a mandate to continue. You guys have attempted this strategy of taking over the Democratic Party for years now, and I have seen nothing but the Democratic Party shifted to the right. So what we need is a hostile working class movement that will bring the ruling class to their needs. Like Sabi mentioned, look how the panic that came from the Biden administration and the ruling class because of the railroad strike. Imagine if we had critical infrastructure and industry that banded together. For example, on the General Strike Summit, we had the uh, Kellogg Strike uh, Union leader on the panel, and he uh, had a great answer when we asked him. We said, will you be willing to work with other industries and team up for a general strike? And he kind of gave me a reaction that he would never even ask that question before. And his answer was, of course, yes. Of course, yes, because this is the leverage we need. And you can build this labor movement through a third party apparatus. So you can have third parties, which I believe should be engaging in mutual aid, showing up for the community. Because like I said, you guys got to reconcile with the fact that workers are being left behind. A lot of people just want to advocate just for the working class, but you guys are ignoring the poor. What about the people who are homeless? What are the people about who can't pay their rent? So you have to show up, engage in mutual aid, communicate with people, and, and like CJ said, build this third party through labor action, through mutual aid, which is a hostile outside movement. And through that, and, and I wish a lot of communicators would explain this part as well, 5%, that third party get federal funding. Imagine you have a mutual aid party that is getting federal funding. 15%, we're at a debate stage. We talked about this before, Bree. How much, how, what percentage of the population do you need to affect change? Some say 3%. You say 3%, that's a great number. Imagine, Bree, if we have 15%. Not only are we at the debate stage, we have a mutual aid society that is taking care of the workers that are left behind by the two-party duopoly. Now they are engaged. When I, when I engage in mutual aid in Kansas City, I got a new uh, diaper run. I'm about to do a new mutual aid event. And I already have people reaching out and say, oh, my God, I want to help. I want to This guy just uh, reached out to me today and said he want to help uh, buy some diapers. Over the last few years, Bree, we sent millions of dollars to the Bernie Sanders campaign. For what? Hmm. For what? Imagine if this money in infrastructure was used to build a third party. These are things that the Davis Rhodes, the boutique, managerial class, they don't even explain to people. Let's get to 5%. 5%, we got a massive mutual aid third party. 15%, we won. <laughs> At that point, it's game over. We got a massive amount of people in the streets. We, get, we we forcing them to either put us on a debate stage or they got to make headlines by kicking us out. I'm good for either way. Either way is good for us. So uh, I'll pass it to you guys because I want you guys to understand that is a theory of change they are not representing by having and engaging with Jones Strikes. I know that was the main question. Engaging with Jones Strikes with combination of third parties plus mutual aid, this is how you create change. This is an effective strategy that the inside game, once again, I cannot stress enough, abandon. So I was all for the progressives that are willing to challenge the Democratic Party establishment if they was want, willing to work with this outside mutual aid game. They are not. They, are, they ain't showing to Rome's tour for the poor. They're not helping us feed the homeless. They're not uh, showing up to anti-war rallies. So we, if you don't want to join us, fine. We do our own stuff. We need to do our own movement. It's not going to happen with the two-year election cycle they brainwashed us to focus on. Just focus on two years. And my last point I want to make, they will call us a nihilist because we don't believe in supporting this failed strategy of supporting the Democratic Party. Bree, what is the, the biggest nihilist are the people who lose an election. And then they say, oh, whoa, it's me. We're screwed. Donald Trump won. We're all going to die. That's the biggest nihilist. When Trump won, I'm like, okay, let's organize. Joe Biden won, let's organize. Because that doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, I, I am torn a little bit about this because I do, I do want to, I do want to say that I respect enormously what folks like David Sirota have done in this space, because but for a lot of their research and knowledge of how things actually work procedurally on the Hill, I, for one, would not have had the ability to advocate for things like force the vote and to understand how the voting mechanisms work to be able to make the case that uh, Kevin McCarthy was never going to be Speaker of the House. And you know all of the machinations around the Pfeiffer 15 and things like that. And I do think that part of the issue is that there is this, there is such a paucity of 
kind of leaders and people who want to assume that particular mantle that we want and perhaps people have the responsibility to take that up because they're knowledgeable in this space like David Zerota. And then when people like him don't necessarily want to or aren't on the front edge of advocating for one strategy or approach or another, it can feel disappointing and sometimes even slip over into kind of a tacit or implicit covering for the way that things have always been in these ineffective strategies. So I understand the frustration there. But at the same time, I also don't know where I would be in this space without people who just had the basic know-how. And I think the the problem is that sometimes like people are in their roles and they're good in their roles, but there's this push for people to be in roles that they kind of don't belong in because there's no one there. I should say there are very few people, credible people at least, who are willing to to fill that space. Can I speak to that point? And you're, what you said is exactly 100% I agree. And the space that David Sirota belongs in is writing to the point that you, you're speaking to. He writes beautifully. He, he, he uncovers things that we don't know about the Democratic Party, like the details, not just, you know, a headline. That's great. The problem is when people like him and Mary and Marion Williamson get into the space where now they're trying to sheep herd the working class. Now you're in our backyard. Just imagine this. Imagine you're at home because this is how I see it. You're at home. You, you know, I'm, I'm in my hood. I'm in Compton. And then there's a person driving through your city telling people in your city lies. That's what's happening by you telling people to vote for the Democratic Party. Well, let me ask you this, CJ, because this was this was an issue that came up. Let, let's let's speak in specifics, because I, I really have no problem with criticizing anybody, but I would prefer to do it to their face because, you know, these are all people who come in and out and I want them to have an opportunity to. David Sirota blocked this and he refuses but, to come on. He's a weak yeah, person and we no one should be listening to David Sirota. Well, CJ, you know, I, I know that you don't believe that to be true because, you know, I do I, believe I that to be true. Bree. This is a point that we have a very large disagreement is David Sirota. Well, but CJ, to this point, I was just on your show and in the context of your own stream, you brought up at least one, perhaps more David Sirota article, right? From the lever. And so to say something like David Sirota isn't valuable in the space, or I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but whatever it was that you just said, I've forgotten now. You know, I think that's just obviously untrue. And I think that we can keep the critique you know, legitimate and narrow. I'm sorry. I said, I acknowledge that his space is in what I said, and that was intentional. In the, in the stream, I like to use, when I'm critiquing the progressive strategy, I'm gonna use your own word. So I, that was intentional to use the lever in that stream that you saw. But the point is, he writes beautifully, and I'm acknowledging that. You're, you uncovering the Democratic Party is a great thing. You critiquing the Democratic Party is a great thing. There's never a critique from RBN about that space. It's when you crawl, cross over and now you're trying to tell people to go vote for the Democratic Party. Now, if you're on the left, now if you're a liberal, that's what liberals are supposed to do. But if you're trying to say you're in the space in the left sphere, the RBN just simply can't happen. This is another blind spot that we're speaking to. The professional managerial class have this specific blind spot, DSA, Jacobin Magazine. This is what we're talking about. David Sirota is another one. So CJ, wait a minute though. D I, I just want to be really clear on this. It's the argument that- It's like this untouchable Sirota. person that you can't touch because he writes well, because he has an Oscar. None of that makes any difference to the working class. Though. I, who is anybody is anybody saying that we cannot touch David Sirota or am I trying to just to get really specific? I'm speaking to the point that there's a pushback by people in the professional managerial class when we we specifically critique certain people and David Sirota is one of them. That's what I'm speaking to. There's a specific like like uh, like a specific like offense that people in the professional managerial class take when we talk about cj i i just want to be really clear if i could just get a word in i'm not offended i just think that there are 
I, I literally couldn't do my job. And I suspect you would have a real issue doing your job as well if people like David Sirota weren't just writing beautifully, but doing investigative research that's really necessary for us to move forward. So I think it's perfectly fair to say, I, for, for what I wanted to say earlier was just, I, I don't know, per, I think that David Sirota can make his individual decisions about whether he wants to vote for Biden. I didn't vote for Biden. David Sirota has never told me to vote for Biden. I've never felt pressure from David Sirota to vote for Biden. I can disagree with him and have done so vocally on this show and elsewhere about the value of various strategies. But I, I think that sometimes we put these people in roles to say that, oh, he he's sheep herding people. Now, someone who's running for office, I think that's a much more credible argument. So I would love to move to some of these potential candidates in 2024. But I don't know that it's fair to, to put on David Sirota that he's sheep herding people in the Democratic Party because he voted for Biden. If there's something more specific that he said or done you want to point to, I'm happy to talk about that as well. It's the white Sorry. misleadership class. We did a stream on this. It's called the white misleadership class. You have people like David Sirota, Marion Williamson, uh, Robert Welch. I always say his pronounce his name wrong. It's Robert the, yeah, Robert Wright. I'm sorry, but yeah, uh, that's actually my my brother's favorite political guy, and I always pronounce his name wrong. But but it's 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 the it's the recycling of the Justice Democrats idea. It's that, and what the influence you have if you have thousands or if not hundreds of thousands of people reading your work that's the influence right but it, did he write an article and, I, and maybe he did and i don't know so i'm asking did he write an article but wait cj can i just let me ask you this question specifically cj cj let me ask you this let me ask you this cj let me ask you this question specifically did, did and if i if i missed it please do let me know but did david sirota write an article that said you know people should vote for joe biden I'm not sure. I, I mean, I haven't done a stream on one, but I'm specifically talking about David Sirota asking people. He he tweets about it all the time. Like, are are we going to pretend like this is not what he does? Like, I've done Tweet, several I'm streams. Just trying to understand. Tweets about like, I've what? done I've done several streams on this. So, the other two of you can get in here and help clarify if if you have examples. He is he is saying the strategy should be for the left. We're in the space where there are strategies being discussed about what the left should do. And he is one of the people in the spaces saying the strategy should be this, should be the Justice Democrats strategy. He is one of the people. Marianne so, Williamson is another one of these people. Yeah, Sabi, Sabi, go ahead. I, I want to, CJ, with all due respect, I just want to make sure the other panelists have uh, get a word in. So uh, Sabrina. There was there was one clip in particular that I did see with David Sirota. It was from Crystal Kyle and Friends. And he was basically saying that people who don't want to do the strategy anymore are nihilists, right? And, and Oh yeah, no, we talked about that. <laughs> there, was some, <laughs> there was there was some name calling in that in that clip as well. And so after yeah, so after I saw that clip, I actually emailed David Sirota and I, I told him, I think there may be a misunderstanding. I, I feel I was very professional in that email. I said, I think there may be a misunderstanding. It's not that we're saying don't do anything and just give up. We just think the strategy should be different this time around. And I invited David Sirota on for that discussion. Uh, David Sirota did not want to come on for that discussion, but he continued to go back on Twitter uh, Twitter, Twitter, and call people names who want to do a different strategy. So that's the thing. It's like, if, if that's how he feels, then I don't understand why he's not open to having that discussion and hearing a different option. Mm, mm, I, I, see. Think, I think the source of a lot of the mistrust, because I, I explained earlier on in this show, we feel like black leftist voices have been shut out from the mainstream, right? So if David Schroeder disagrees with our theory of change, that is okay. But for him to block every, I've never even interacted with the guy. And he blocked me just because he saw our criticism of him. You know, the frustration, because remember what I said earlier, I think we miscalculated and we thought the Bernie Sanders movement was bigger, bigger than it was. We would think that us being the members of the working class that you guys claim you're fighting for, that you would be at least open to a conversation. Nina Turner is not. Yeah. Uh, David Schroeder is not. Anna Kasparian is not. All these people, like Dan, Anna and David Schroeder preemptively block me just because they hear me say opinions that they dislike. How is that allyship? So when you guys hear the frustration on CJ's voice, it's because we don't acknowledge these people as fighting for us. Yes, they might may write a good 
uh, an article once once in a while. But what is the value of this article if you're telling people to vote for the people that is, is responsible for the pain and suffering? It seems like you are just profiting for, off our exploitation. If you got well, that, a camera, that's, it, that's where I would got, disagree. I, I think it's more than just like a great article or well-written article. It's investigative research without which we wouldn't even know any of this was happening. So I, I, I think that I can credit I your other criticisms, but I, I don't know that I would need to like minimize the work that people are doing to criticize I'm, the I'm kind of political valences. The only point of view I have. But I, Imagine if we didn't exist, you would not even hear this critique of David Sirota. You see the blind spot of the professional well, manager. Well, like, cause well, David Sirota, everybody bows down to him on, you know, in DSA, Jacob, in that type, the professional managerial class, the reformist. Really, it was, like, it's really saying, like I, a, I, a I, bowing down, talking about his Oscar. It's really sickening to a person in the, in the working class as you talk about him having an Oscar while we're over here can't feed our family. It's really sickening. It's really sickening to even see that. With all due respect, I've been really proud of having the coverage of that you described with Davis Aroda. And I don't know that many people have engaged with him as substantively as I have right here on this show, including going back and forth with him very publicly about the issues related to force the vote and having some, you know, tense offline conversations as well to get him to the place where he moved to ultimately, I know that was unsatisfactory to a lot of folks that it took any time, but ended up being a supporter of it and frankly contributing to the idea in ways that I personally found to be very valuable as he offered up other kinds of asks that could be added on to the demand in addition to Me Medicare for All. But the reason that I don't want to necessarily focus on David Sirota is because he's not running for office and isn't really implicated here. And as far as I know, it's kind of just an individual with an individual choice who I think is a little sidestepping the is this issue. And the real issue, I think, where you guys have a, a really substantive critique here is about what to do with various people who are going to definitely run in 2024. I know that, Sabi, you recently came on and talked about, and you know, obviously on your own stream, I've talked about AOC and the conversation she recently had in GQ about whether she is going to run for president. Obviously, Marianne Williamson is someone that I talked with with Crystal Ball about potentially running and being a leftist, uh, the kind of the left banner guard running in, in 2024. Marianne Williamson has been on this show and talked kind of um, openly about her willingness to engage in a dirty break strategy. That being the case, Sabi, I wonder what you make of that. Like if there were somebody running on a Democratic Party ticket in 2024 who had openly said they were willing to do the dirty break and run as a Democrat until the point at which they made it impossible for them to keep being in the party and then pivoted off, peeled off and ran as a third party candidate, would you be open to supporting someone who had that kind of a strategy? I'm not sure I would trust that person because if that was your plan, you wouldn't tell everybody about that out in the open. Um, well, that's the I catch think, 22, right? Yeah. You either, you either don't say it and then everyone thinks they're just running as a Democrat and doesn't support you, or you say it and are either pushed all the way out of the Democratic Party before you get started, or people think that you're you're just saying that to get support. Correct. And I think that, you know, I, I've talked to Marianne Williamson a couple of times uh, on my show. I feel that there are some issues that she's really good on. Like I talked to her before about reparations. She gave a whole history about that and why she had that as like her number one platform when she ran in 2020. I also talked to her about women's health issues. She came on and she gave a lot of insight about that as well. Uh, my concern with Marianne Williamson, however, is the fact that this, again, is somebody who is very wealthy. Uh, I think we need someone who is from the working class or someone who is is poor, someone who knows what those those struggles are like. And then the other issue with Marianne is, is her views on foreign policy have really rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, and foreign policy should be very important to all of us, even though it's abroad. And I say this because this is the one policy where the president can act alone and doesn't necessarily need the support of Congress. And we've seen that happen with Biden, Bush, Obama, multiple presidents that we've had before in the past. So it is really important to me that we have someone who understands that it is not OK to be an imperialist. It is not OK to have war. And I don't think that Marianne gets that. And I, I've seen people try to explain this to her, how she was incorrect on the Israel-Palestine issue, uh, other issues abroad as well. 
and she seemed to double down. So that those are big concerns to me. So as as president, uh, a no go. And I personally wouldn't support anyone running through the two party system. Um, I think the person I spoke to recently who I think actually has the best platform that is John Stasevich, and he's running as an independent. Uh, some people have brought him on recently. I think he has the best platform. And that's the person that I believe if you're a progressive or a left, if you should be pushing, if you want to do something different. Can I ask you to just dr drill down and get a little more specific about what your concerns are with respect to Marianne Williamson and foreign policy? I know we all saw what emerged on Twitter the day of the Afghan Afghanistan withdrawal last year. Um, and there was some back and forth and some ultimate, I think, acquiescence on the idea of why she was tweeting about um, women and children. But are there, are there specific foreign policy kind of takes with respect to what we should be doing in Afghanistan or with respect to U.S. imperialism and with the um, Israel-Palestine that you can speak to? She comes across to me as a Zionist. The same thing with John Fetterman. Um, and I know there's there's good things about John Fetterman, but there's some things about John Fetterman, I think, that should give a lot of people pause. Uh, the fact that he said that he would be for uh, going for Israel. If but he just, were I'm so sorry, Sabi, but just, against... just to stay on the Marianne for, for a second, because if we do say that, if you know, if we say something like I think that she's an imperialist or a Zionist, I want to make sure that we unpack that credibly. So what what is it specifically for those who haven't seen this? That makes you think that she might be a, a Zionist. Nick can speak to that because we did a stream yeah. on her sure. about that. Sure. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm gonna explain to you guys my problem with people wedging on these very important issues, and this is very common with John Fetterman and a lot of progressives like Nina Turner who uh, pretty much disavow BDS, right? Well, just so Nick, just we can problem, see with Marianne. Just I know for with Marianne. A second. We're, we're, yeah. We're, Regarding just, Marianne, just because her name was put out there, and we just got to deal with it because yeah, now. I'm, yeah, I'm getting there. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll get there. So. She says stuff like Israel has the right to defend himself, right? And that is deeply problematic because what does that mean? I'm asking you guys that question. When you say Israel has the right to defend yourself when they are a settler colonialist, that's her saying that she approved with the ethnic genocide that that state is doing. Because when you see Hamas and the Palestinians respond, that's in response to the ethnic cleansing. Now let's team that up with their position of renouncing BDS. So if you're saying that Hamas and Palestinians are bad people and that Israel had the right to slaughter them and their children for responding, and then you're against BDS, what does that mean? Because BDS is the peaceful protest against Israel. So if you're speaking out against both those things, you're essentially saying that Palestinians need to sit here and accept the oppression they are faced by Israel. Now, the theory of change that a lot of the progressives have is, oh, well, we have to hedge on this Israel issue or APAC will come after us. Mm -hmm. We have to sell out the Palestinians in order to win over the white working class. We, we have to support uh, funding domestic terrorism bill, bills, which all the squad voted for. Luckily, the Republicans shut it down because we got appealed to the white working class. That's the boutique left strategy. Let's win elections by supporting imperialist ideas in order for us to get meager, unseen gains for the working class. Now, regarding Afghan. Repeating the same lies we see on MSNBC. Oh my God, we got to stay in Afghanistan because we are protected Afghan women. The quality of life for Afghan women dropped since U.S. occupation. And it's okay if you're ignorant about these things, but when you have people like us trying to educate you, when, when I see the massive amount of anti-imperialists reaching out and trying to explain to you, and your your response is like, "No, I'm not having conversations. This is my this is my stance. I'm not changing it." That does not seem legitimate to me. Now, these same people who was talking about, oh, we got to stay in Afghanistan because of Afghan women, they are dead silent now that Joe Biden is starving millions of Afghanistan people. These same people are going to say vote for Joe Biden in 2024. This guy is starving millions of Afghan people. Now, all of a sudden, quiet about Afghan women. You guys see the problem here? When you vote for the Democrat Party, you are giving them a mandate to fund genocide. But that's not a big deal to them. Uh, just a small disagreement. Do you guys see the problem? So what's, I, and I, 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 this may, I, my tone is slightly different. Like, I don't think these people are bad people. I just think they make giant missteps and it's not allyship when you deny even conversations where people try and bring this up to you. And I just don't, I don't see the, I don't see the allyship here on the left. And that is what I explained multiple times. I thought when we were not organized with the Bernie Sanders movement, I thought we were all gonna come together and we're gonna communicate how to best spread left ideas. That is not what happened. 
We had an elite inside that locked themselves in their echo chambers, and then they denied conversation with anyone who pushed back against them. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon.com slash podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.